for many of years, there has been a story that I've teased my subscribers with. Today, we talk about it. The true story behind how I was scammed out of $15,000 on the counterfeit Snake Pit Les Paul. Welcome back, Troglodytes, to your daily dose of guitar information, the Troglis Guitar Show. In September of 2016, I was out of college for a couple of years, ready to start my life. I had just purchased my house, my wife and I were thinking about starting a family, we were very low on funds at this time, but I like to buy and sell guitars on top of my grocery store job. And on eBay, an opportunity arose that got me excited. A Gibson Snake Pit Les Paul from 1997, up for open auction, no reserve. Now at this point in time, there were quite a few Snake Pit Les Pauls for sale, generally ranging between $25,000 up to $50,000 in asking price. If you're not familiar with this model, it is the first publicly available slash signature guitar. 50 were made in the first run, and then an additional 50 later on. So you can bet your butt I was there for the ending of this auction in the middle of the night. I bid and bid trying to win this very cool iconic guitar, and with a little bit of luck, I won. But little did I know this was going to be the biggest mistake of my guitar career. So as you guys can tell, I've laid out this entire story with all these tabs to completely prove my tale that I'm not making any of this stuff up. Let's go through this. So September 13th, very late at night, 11.28 p.m., I won this auction for $15,100. And I'm going to blur out the seller's name throughout this video because I don't want to get sued. But he was from Hot Water, Mexico, and he had decent feedback. And it wasn't just random feedbacks, like sometimes scammers will build up their own account with a bunch of feedbacks, normally not up to 226. But this is actually purchases from real guitar stores like Philadelphia Luthier Tools, Only Music, Guitar Parts Factory, Texas Guitar Shop, Cream Tone Music, Adirondack Curly Maple. So clearly this is a real guitar guy. The only thing that was a little bit questionable in his listing was the photos were not all that good. Now unfortunately this was over five years ago so I don't have the original listing to show you guys but through these emails you can see the leading photo. They were all just kind of like that. Nothing super close up, pretty much all far away but it was enough to tell that okay that is a slash snake pit and yes it does look good enough. And at this point in time, I wasn't sure, you know, how much these things actually sold for. I figured somewhere between 20 to 25 was realistic. So when I got it for 15, I thought all these factors of not the best photos and maybe not a lot of people want to buy this much money from a guitar for sale in Mexico, everything was kind of looking good here. So I was really excited for this. I needed to make some money. And to be quite frank, I just wanted to have this guitar in my hands because it was super cool. So after I had won the auction, the seller contacted me. Hello, good night. Would you accept to complete the order at 19,500 and I ship the guitar tomorrow? Because I put the minimal price that I would sell this for for 19,500. <laughs> at this point, I was like, uh, no, that that's not how eBay works. I won this for $15,000. You're either going to sell it to me for that or you can just cancel the transaction. Either way is fine, but that's what I'm going to pay. So he agrees the, the price that I actually wanted at, it's good. Only if I make the payment now, and then he'll ship it out tomorrow. So at this point, I was getting kind of sketched out by the seller with that whole thing, but I think what he meant to do was put a reserve on the guitar for 19500 That's why I gave him the option to back out. I'm not going to force somebody to sell me a guitar. But I wanted to get a few more additional photos from him before I actually submit this $15,000. I'd never, ever spent that much on a guitar before. And I ended up getting the photos and everything kind of looked okay to me at that point in time. Unfortunately, I don't still have those photos because eBay doesn't keep them. But thankfully, I do have this like summary email thread that we can show you. Now, here's where the first bump in the road comes along. eBay was not letting me check out. They said the amount was too high for PayPal to be used. At that point in time, anything over $10,000, PayPal is like, nah, -uh, you can't do that. At least on a fairly new account. It might have been different for somebody that had used PayPal more often than I did at this point in time. Gotta remember, this is like the very beginning of my buying, trading, selling days. Not the absolute beginning, but you know, nowhere near as far as we are into the journey today. 
So I asked him if he could instead make three new listings using these same photos. Basically have one listing be, you know, 5,000, 5,000, 5,000 to make it up. But in order for him not to scam me, I was like, hey, how about I buy the fretboard, the neck, and the body and parts in separate listings? He didn't quite understand what I was trying to say there. I think he was trying to get me to fix PayPal to take the 15,000 in one lump sum payment. So I basically restated what I needed to do. But you gotta remember, this is like 1 a.m. I had to go to work at 6 a.m. So it's like, you know, I, I'm perfectly fine paying this. Let's just go like through PayPal or something like that. And I'll pay it when I wake up in five hours. Thank you. I went to bed. But the next morning, I found that he was asking for my address. So I provided that phone number, all that, because sometimes international shipments need that. And then he makes a shipment by DHL Express with said tracking number. And then he said, it will be delivered tomorrow. <laughs> and I was like, okay, thank you, my friend. It's amazing how fast they can get this guitar from Mexico all the way up to me in Ohio so quickly. Like he was stating this would be overnight shipment, which I really didn't believe, but I was very excited at the chance. Now, granted, he also charged me like $300 for shipping. So I guess it makes sense that the, it'd be express, but overnight, that, that just didn't make any sense. So then I started asking him how long he'd had the guitar, where he got it from. And he said he had purchased it in 2002 in San Diego, California. And he told me a little bit about his other collections, but yeah, surprise, surprise, DHL did not have that to me the very next day. Essentially, the reason it didn't make it is they needed a Lacey Act form filled out, basically saying the guitar is made out of wood, what wood it is. That's very basic, common stuff that I deal with all the time when I import guitars. But again, at this point in time, this was the first one that I gotten from out of the country, as far as I remember. So we got that all squared away, and delivery was then set to that Monday. So, it had arrived. I had unboxed it. I was just absolutely thrilled with this thing. I can't believe it actually arrived from bidding on this on eBay. Something at a fantastic deal. I'm going to be able to make a little bit of money, pay off my house quicker, things like that. It was a very exciting new guitar day and it just looked phenomenal to me. I got that snake, the snake inlay on the fretboard. It's got that gorgeous dark red finish. It's all Gibsoned and slashed out. I mean, you gotta remember at this point in time, I had never seen a modern day Gibson. I was really into like the 70s and 80s Gibsons. Anything modern, I was like, no. And now today I'm like the exact opposite because I've explored the 70s and 80s so much. There's not so many things that get me excited anymore. But the new guitars, there's always something new coming out to get you excited. I mean, like th this was back when I still called Les Pauls Les Pauls. Les Paul. Because I thought that's just how it was. So I was just overjoyed at first to have this. I didn't realize these small things that I were seeing on here weren't just replaced parts or being a player's grade model because what showed up actually had a little bit more wear and tear than I was expecting, but nothing like too crazy like headstock repairs or anything. But the things in this video that I pointed out were weird is in the finish is what I saw was a sparkle. I was not expecting that. But it wasn't like a super sparkle, but it still had like a slightly metallic sheen to it. I really wasn't too sure. I just thought, okay, I guess this is part of the snake pit. At this point in time, there was not a lot to compare this to online photo wise. The nut was actually bad when I got it, like it was too low, it caused a bunch of buzzing, so I had shimmed the bottom of it with some blue painter's tape in order to get it to be the height that it needed to be. But even then, some of the frets were kind of high, I think I remember was like 5 or 6 of them, and when I did my leveling gauge it seemed like they could be filed down a bit because it still wasn't perfectly playable. So it's like, man, this thing just must have been used a lot. Are modern day Gibsons really this bad? You know, that strange mindset I had back then. But to me, that snake just looks so cool. It's got all the inlay work that I was expecting to see. But I remember tearing it apart and seeing slash logoed pickups. So I thought at that point in time, okay, yeah, that makes sense. Having slash logoed pickups and a slash signature Les Paul. I thought it was strange that the ABR1 saddles weren't notched. But at that point in time, I really hadn't had much experience with ABR1 bridges in general. I didn't know if that was a normal thing or not. <laughs> 
The switch tip on it was strangely sawn down, which I thought was weird for a guitar of this caliber. And along the binding, it had kind of turned red, like a binding bleed, which Gibsons are known to do. At that point in time, I had no idea. I just thought maybe that was a feature of the guitar. And it also had strap locks on it. Maybe they were replaced on this. So I made sure to disclose them in this video of me advertising it for sale. But at this point in time, like I had no idea it was fake. Like this video, it took me a few years to actually update the title to Counterfeit 1998 Gibson Les Paul slash a snake pit. Before then it was just, you know, 1998, blah, 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 blah. It wasn't until I was 100% sure that I wanted to make sure just in case you know this guitar shows up somewhere after I die or whatnot, somebody could find it and know that it was not real. At this time, I thought it was 100% real. It came to me in some case that wasn't what it should be. So I had one of these cases that's not the exact fit for this guitar. Like it's a slightly later custom shop case, but I thought it'd be good to advertise it like this because there was no paperwork on this guitar, but I had to list it for 30,000 plus $500 shipping. I took all the detailed photo shots that I could, but to be honest, this is just my basic photo style. It's still the exact same style that I use yet today. Although I'm in a slightly different location now than I am when these were taken, it's just my standard stuff trying to be honest when selling guitars here. I did not know this was not legit. And I had received quite a few offers for this. The first one was for 10,000 bucks, which I just kind of laughed at. It's like, hey, I want 30,000 for this. Next one was for 15,000 plus 500. That was making me feel real good. I could at least get out of this guitar because that's about how much I had into it all with shipping costs and everything. I think I was countering offers at like uh, 20,000 maybe. I'm not sure. I had some guy trying to trade me a Dumble for this thing. And at that point in time, I had no idea what a Dumble was. <laughs> it's a high-end boutique amplifier that sells for crazy money today. And at one point in time, I was actually offered an Angus Young SG Artist Proof, which at the time, this is the only one that I could find that had been for sale previously. It was like $26,000, but I was weighing my options between like, you know, Slash and Angus Young. Angus, super iconic, but at that point in time, I was more into Slash. So I always had this one in the back of my mind as like, you know, that's pretty good trade fodder, I would say, because a custom shop artist proof, you know, that's something that Angus has had or potentially at least seen. So I'd contacted somebody else who had bought an expensive guitar for me before. He was kind of like a broker for people overseas to see if A, he'd be interested in the snake pit. And then when he wasn't, because he already had one, I said, hey, w what about this? You know, maybe I can make that trade work. Apparently it was artist proof number eight of 12 that I was being offered and uh, I don't think he was interested but that kind of gave you an idea of some of the offers that I was getting on this thing most people thought this was legit at this time then I had one guy who was trying to buy it kind of locally like he was up in Michigan he was going to drive down and this is the first guy who kind of planted that seed of doubt in my mind after I had sent him those additional pictures of the sparkles I was saying he backed away at that point and that's when I was like mm, is there something wrong with this guitar but I wasn't 100% sure because you know maybe this guy backed out for other reasons I didn't really know but then a eBay user reached out to me and he started doubting the pickups because his signature model wasn't out at that time so having the slash insignias on the back of those doesn't make sense so that's when I was like okay maybe, maybe there's quite a few replaced parts on this thing and then I was starting to think about the other things that I noticed that okay maybe that's not normal maybe there is something going on with this So I reached out to the initial seller. I was like, do you have more information on this guitar's history? I'm, I'm having doubts of its authenticity. I wasn't 100% sure yet because I was still in a little bit of denial. Just spent all this money on three different credit cards that I couldn't necessarily pay back right away until I sold the guitar. You know, I had a house mortgage and all that stuff to pay on top of all that. That was all brand new to me at that time. I just moved out of my mom's house. But at that point, I, I tested the finish under black light. And I'm telling them that that's just not looking right after I've looked at it again. And there's many things off about the guitar. So he told me he's going to send me pictures that will answer all of my doubts. And this is what he sent me. He said, hi, Austin, sending photos of Theodore Harrison, the sir who sold me this guitar in 2002. He told me that every guitar is a little bit different because everything was hand carved. 
Okay, so we got a picture of a guy here, apparently at Gibson. We can see right over here, you've got the Butterfly Ultima fretboard. You've got a bunch of the original snake pits being built right here. That is really cool. So he was essentially telling me that, you know, this was that guitar in process of being built. This is what he was given when he had purchased the guitar. This was the builder of the Slash Snake Pits. I mean, this is the Gibson factory right here. And he had quite a few photos of this guy in here. Like here, it looks like an Explorer E2, which wasn't in production at that time. Maybe that's something else. But he was saying he bought this guitar from the guy in the photos. He was admitting that he didn't know if it had been refinished at that point in time. So at that point, I thought, okay, these other guys are just weird. They're not telling the truth. And this guy, he had those photos. It, it seemed to make sense at the time. Now, you know, hindsight's always twenty twenty. that those were just random photos. And since I couldn't find those anywhere else on the internet, uh, okay, I guess it has to be true. But then I got a message on eBay. Unfortunately, I don't have it anymore. It was a guy who owned a snake pit. He took the time to take the photos between his and compare it to mine. And that really put the nail in the coffin. Because here was a photo of mine. And here was a photo of a real snake pit. He was mentioning things like the shape of the head right here. It's very angular. Whereas on mine, it slopes down and it's not all the same. Other things were how wide the snake was. The hood ends here and then goes almost all the way to the edge of the fretboard. Whereas mine, it comes way short of that and not quite as far there. And the tongue looked a little bit weird. He took a look at his truss rod cover and slashes right there, big bold print. Then when you look at mine, you can tell, ooh, yeah, that is not right. Wrong font. The whole truss rod cover itself looks like trash. At this point in time, there were never very good photos that were close-ups until this eBay seller sent them to me. Like, I was trying to get these from other people. The best thing I had, I think, was this YouTube video right here by Cessna. Like, you could see this. But the snake, at this angle, it kind of looked a little bit loopy. The hood didn't seem to stretch as far across, but you could definitely see some things, you know, in hindsight 2020, once again, that, yeah, this is definitely a legit one. Because you also have to remember, there were two runs of these guitars. I thought maybe since this is part of the second run, since the serial number's after 50, did they look different between them? There were questions in my mind about that, because again, there were not very good detailed photos or videos of any of these things available anywhere. So once that happened, I reached out to the seller again, because it's at that point where I'm 100% convinced this is not the real deal. I need to get my money back. So we're now in January as a frame of reference. So I told him, in trying to sell this guitar, I have received evidence and many concerns that this guitar is not an original snake pit. Again, for the second time, but a fairly well-made copy. And at this point in time, I had opened individual PayPal claims on each of these. And he was messaging me because he's saying, I have a problem with my PayPal account. So I told him, I want to return it. I do not wish to sell a counterfeit. And then he responded basically saying, I saw your video on YouTube. You didn't say anything about it being a counterfeit. It's because at that point in time, I didn't know. And he basically was trying to defend himself again. The guy who sold me the guitar, he said, all the snake pits are a little bit different. So he said he would refund my money with an extra if he could give me five months to get it because he needed to sell some guitars because he had already spent the money and he wanted it sent back to him in Dallas, Texas. He just needed the time to do it. But please cancel the request of refund or he can't receive any payments. And it's like, oh, <laughs> yeah, that, that's almost an admission of a scammer. They, they want you to cancel out of the claim because then you can't reopen the claim ever again. But he was promising to give me 16500 if I could just give him some more time. But he was sticking strong to the fact that it's a legit 1997 version of this guitar. And Mr. Harrison that sold it to him many years ago, he worked at the custom shop. He once again told him every guitar was a little different because it was handmade. And again, he attached those same photos that we were seeing before. And I fired back with, yeah, sure, some of the painting on the snake pit on the top could be different, but the fretboards are cut up by CNC machines and then hand inlaid. So the snake not matching is just not right especially since the snake's tongue is not even an inlay it was just painted on it's like here's that real one it's actually inlaid whereas this one it's actually painted on its upper lip i mean look at those lips <laughs> big weird juicy lips versus the real one they're not quite as puckered another thing you might notice is the eye is very distinct whereas the eye on this one very small and way too big of a pupil so i was basically questioning his whole story at this point
So I did not cancel the PayPal claims because I knew that was a bad move. I was smart enough not to do that, but he just wanted more time to do this and needed at least four months. So not really wanting to wait at this point in time, I escalated these claims to PayPal to have them step in and solve this because obviously I, I don't want to wait four to six months. I mean, it's not my problem that the guitar is a fake, right? So I escalated all three of these claims. Remember, I bought the guitar on three credit cards, so there's three separate transactions here. And basically what PayPal said is I needed to get some sort of a document that proved it without a doubt that it's not just me making stuff up. Despite having very convincing evidence from that one guy who sent me some stuff and the other people starting to doubt it, PayPal, they can't just go off of internet lore, right? They have to have something direct. I was like, okay, we can do that. That's not a problem. So at that point in time, I had great respect for Groom Guitars. I viewed them as the number one guitar shop in the world. Like if anybody could help me, it'd be Groom's Guitars, right? I knew they offered appraisal services on their website. So I had purchased one of these. I did the appraisal fee, all that other good stuff that was there at the time. I sent them all the photos. I basically did it for them. I was just asking them for a document that said, yes, this guitar is fake. I provided all the evidence that I had already collected for them. Just, you know, basically do their job for them, but just to have a reputable business stand behind me. And I remember being so gutted by their response. So Joe, who was running their appraisal team at the time, said, Austin, we must respectfully decline to appraise. I was flabbergasted. The number one guitar shop in my eyes can't appraise this guitar? And the reasoning was because no one on their team's actually seen a genuine slash snake pit model in person, so they're unable for 100% sure say if it's real or fake. I mean, I was hoping the general guidelines of what a real Gibson is versus what it's not should have been good enough, like the things like the inlays not being right, the fret nibs not lining up. But I get it. They didn't want to get involved into this in case, you know, who knows, maybe they get called into court because of all that. They didn't want to get involved. I, I can respect that. They at least said, hey, why don't you check Gibson customer service? Now, obviously, Gibson customer service, they can't help identifying a guitar that's a really good replica. Now, like a Chinese <laughs> fake, yes, they can help you with that. But something as in-depth as that, no, they, they weren't any help. <laughs> in fact, I remember calling them at the beginning to see if it was legit, and they told me it was, because obviously, the serial number does correlate to a real snake pit. So at this point in time, PayPal was like, hey, uh, we kind of need this. It's time sensitive. I think they gave you like three business days. So they granted me an extension because I was like, OK, well, this first place I was expecting them to help me. And they said no. So at this point, I had a good relationship with Chicago Music Exchange. As you can see right here, I've sold them 80 guitars over the years. Some of these at some uh, pretty good deals in comparison to, you know, what guitars sell for today. Here's a 1991 M3 for a thousand bucks. I sold them the 82 V2. I mean, just a whole bunch of guitars like CME. They were good. And I established a relationship with Daniel, their head buyer. They're the ones that bought that BC Rich from me too. But anyways, this guy right here, I had a good working relationship with him. I thought for sure he would be able to help me. There was actually one point in time I went to CME and met with him and sold him a couple of guitars in person. So I viewed him as like a friend at that point. So I was trying to reach out to him and unfortunately he, he couldn't get back to me and PayPal was really on my case that, hey, you've got the three days to come up with this evidence. But Daniel was out on a guitar show, so it wasn't going to be possible. So the CME guys were like, yeah, I'm, I'm sorry, we can't help you. Even though I was begging them, showing them all the evidence again. It's like, come on, I'm going to get scammed out of $15,000. Can't you guys just help me? You guys deal with the Gibson guitars. You should be able to tell, you know, these things. But nobody wanted to get in the middle of it. So now do you guys understand why on my website I offer these types of private help web sessions? Yes, that's also how I make money because I learned all this stuff through experience and I can identify guitars good enough that I can at least provide for you documents in PayPal cases and things like that. That's why I offer that service because this whole experience just frustrated me to no end that nobody would help me even with the evidence provided. And I mean nothing against Groons or CME. This is not bashing them in any way. I understand they did not want to get involved. So 
I don't know if it was CME or Gibson or who turned me on to this information, just general articles online, but Bruce Kunkel is actually the guy who made these guitars for Gibson, at least the carving part and the inlays and all that. And he actually has his own website. He broke off of the Gibson Custom Shop and does his own stuff. So right here, this is what his website looks like today. Uh, when I saw it, it was just like an all black page. It had some stuff, but he is an extremely gifted artist. But he makes his own Kunkel guitars now, but they're art guitars. So at this point, I had been given my last extension by PayPal. They said, okay, if you seriously don't have this after three days, I mean, this is the second extension they gave me that I wouldn't be able to do it. The guy I was talking to on the phone, I guess he fell for me. <laughs> These places could help me. So I reached out to Bruce. And at first, I remember him being kind of standoffish, like he didn't want to get involved either. But as I told him more and more and more about the story, he definitely seemed that he wanted to help. So once again, I provide to him all the evidence that I know right here. And I told him PayPal is just asking for a very detailed document. As long as he would verify that information and if they called and contact that to verify it, that he would agree. So I was trying to make this as easy as possible. I was offering him, I think, like a hundred bucks just to approve this and say yes, that he sent it if PayPal ever asked. So I proposed this draft for him just to try to make it as easy as humanly possible, because at this point, I just had no faith in anybody to help me. So after all that, he's like, I want to help you, but I need to see this guitar in person for an evaluation or else I cannot. So at that point, it's like, I understand. He's putting his name on the line. And he personally feels attacked in this whole situation because somebody is implicating that he is the one who built it and sold it to this guy as the fake as being an original. So he's being attacked personally here. He wanted to clear his name. He felt that way because I got names crossed. I thought the guy in these photos, he was saying it was Bruce Kunkel instead of the other one. And so when I sent him those photos, that's when there was an aha moment. He was able to verify that was indeed the guy that the seller in Mexico said it was initially before. I had gotten names crossed. This is where he was able to help me find out who that was. He said, wow, that's a shock. Todd Harrison was my apprentice during this project. So he helped him produce some of these guitars. So he reached out to his retired boss to see if they could shed some light on this. I, we never did. He said, Todd is a very talented guitar maker and could pull off a forgery if he wanted to. And he's disappointed if that is what in fact happened. That's all alleged. I really don't believe Todd had anything to do with this, but I honestly don't know. So for legal reasons, this is all allegedly. It, it's not real, but these are real photos from the Gibson factory. I was just absolutely thrilled that this is actually the Gibson factory and these are real photos of a guy that worked there. And Bruce knew who he was. So at this point he was asking me, why did I just not contact Todd Harrison instead of him? But that's because, you know, I thought this was Bruce Kunkel in these photos at that point in time. And Bruce was a lot easier to find. I don't know how to contact that guy even yet today. So at this point, I was kind of feeling bad that I even contact Mr. Kunkel because this was taking a lot out of him. And people told him not to help me anymore, you know, just like the, those other dealers, but he decided to. So he wanted to see the guitar in person. Who do I know in Nashville? Because I was so untrusting of people at this point. I didn't want to send this down to Bruce Kunkel and then it gets stolen. So I sent it down to my good old luthier that was reworking some guitars for me. <laughs> Ah, how I got double scammed out of the guitar. You can watch this video for the full backstory, but essentially there was a luthier down in Tennessee. He was working on a bunch of guitars for me. Sickness struck whether he was actually intentionally trying to scam me or not. I did get about half of the guitars back, including the snake pit, but it was seeming real grim for some time. But I sent it down to him overnight service because I didn't have a lot of time on this last extension. 
And if you guys were wondering why I still trusted this luthier guy, even though he had never sent any guitars back, I mean, he had in-process photos of these things, and he was very responsive at this time. So I sent that guitar down to him, and I do believe he actually ended up getting it to Bruce Kunkel. My memory's a little bit foggy on that, but I do have in my emails that Bruce has this list right here of everything that he decided was not right. So I could be remembering wrong, maybe he never actually got to see it and it never got to him, but it might have. I just honestly don't remember. But anyways, this is what he said was wrong with the guitar. The painting on the snake pit carving was not his work. And if you compare a real one to the fake one, the colors are so much more dark and vibrant on an original one. It kind of makes this one <laughs> look kind of crappy in comparison, but not comparing to AB, it looks pretty darn good. This is when he really pointed out that the snake fingerboard pattern just was not correct, and he shot down any variation on that part would not be real because they were done by CNC machines. So I believe that's where I got this information from. That's when he talks about the hood on the cobra, hugging certain areas and things like that. And this is also where I learned all the belly tiles they should not be at an angle. They need to be parallel to the frets. That is a big thing when you look back between the two. Now, whenever I look at a snake pit, that's the one thing I look for, the flat head and the straight across body segments. So he was saying the reason why this fretboard looks all janky is because it probably was hand cut instead of being produced on a CNC machine. And that's when he also talks about the painted on tongue and he called this metallic trash embedded in the finish. That's why he was calling sparkles. He was saying that would have never happened at the custom shop and it was refinished in an unclean environment by someone with low skills. He was saying the color wasn't right, doesn't have the depth and clarity, the top wasn't really good, the cutaway wasn't quite right, the maple top wasn't high quality caliber, obviously the nut issue that we knew about before, non-slotted ABR1. He said the serial number was poorly aligned, the volume and tone pots were on an aluminum base plate like they do at Gibson USA, not the custom shop. He was saying all the logos were wrong, and if you guys want to know where I ever got this sandblasting knowledge, it was from Bruce Kunkel himself. So the way they do these inblays is they do a photo mask and sandblasting technique that's all done by hand to put the inlays. And the way to know that that was done that way is there's cracking around the logo areas and that is not evident on this one, making it not a real Gibson. So whenever I shed that little light of information when you should see cracking around Gibson logos and things like that after a few years, yeah. It was right here. It was this $15,000 journey that helped me learn that lesson the hard way. <laughs> so he's saying, no, it's not an authentic custom shop guitar. And he suspects it's actually a Gibson USA Les Paul that's been reworked. Now that got me at least happy that, okay, it's not a complete fake. It's potentially that guy bought some Les Pauls, reworked them, and sold a bunch of them as fakes because he's one of the guys that kind of helped create the originals. Again, allegedly. So I thanked him for his time. I redid the attachment with the, what PayPal was wanting. He wanted some changes. And this is what that document looked like. All formatted the way that PayPal wanted it. Dated 2217 with his letterhead, all that. And that was the last time I talked to Mr. Kunkel. He said he hopes it works out for me. At this point, I am just absolutely elated. After this whole struggle, finding out the guitar was a fake, being denied help from many of reputable shops, I finally tracked down the original builder. He's kind enough to help me. I sent the guitar all the way down to Nashville to get it verified and all that. I submit the document to PayPal, getting ready to get my money back and send the guitar back. Everything's going to be great, all hunky-dory again. And almost instantaneously, I get this email. We've decided case ID PP0054222482241. So I'm like, okay, yeah, that must have been open and shut because, you know, I've uploaded this document. Oh, it, it, it's going to be so good. Finally, the ending of the story. Dear Troglies, We've completed our review, and unfortunately, we are not able to decide this case in your favor. What? What? After all that that they put me through, those people decided it in the seller's favor. We never received a reply in response to our inquiries because we did not hear from you before the deadline provided. Your case has been closed. 
So obviously, I mean, I'm getting fired up just reading this message again. Oh my gosh. It's just, it makes no sense. So obviously I call them up enraged. I, I chew through a whole bunch of CSR people until I get to a manager demanding an explanation for this. And unfortunately, this was on the phone. I, I don't have backup evidence of this. But the reason they gave me, despite turning that in the day that it was due on my second extension, they said it is not valid because I should not have been granted that second extension. And it was an error on that PayPal employee's part. And that did not sit right with me. Not at all. It was given to me. I don't care if it wasn't supposed to have been given to me. It was given to me and I provided the document within that time frame. But you have to remember, at this point in time, it's only PayPal that's on the line. It's not necessarily the seller at this point. It would just be them being out of money. And they're basically saying, yeah, we're not going to lose $15,000 over this. So they stuck the bill on me and said, yeah, good luck with that, buddy. So I told them I'm going to sue them. I've got an aunt that's a lawyer. <laughs> and I probably should have. But... Uh, I was too ashamed at this point. I forget what they call it. Like sometimes bad things happen to people and they just don't want to talk about it and they just blame themselves. So I just kind of kept this bottled up for years. I don't, I don't think I told anybody in my family for many years after that. I was just too ashamed. I didn't know where to get help or anything like that. And I'd never sued anybody at that point. So it's like, meh. So at that point, I'm just absolutely devastated. I really didn't know what to do. So I just contacted Sergio about all this to see if he would still give me my money back and be a good guy. And I was just trying to get him to agree to it. And he's like, yeah, I'll do it. I'll, I'll give it back. Just give me time. So this time he was only going to give me the $15,100 USD instead of that sixteen five he had previously offered. And, you know, he's apologizing this whole time. So at this point, I really wanted to expedite this process. Like I was willing to take his reissues and like sell them for him or take them in exchange for the guitar. And I was telling him this guitar is already down my luthier. I mean, if you want him to redo the binding, make it look good, get the frets level, proper refit and all that it'd be great since now he knows it's fake and if you're going to be stuck with a fake guitar you might as well be stuck with a nice looking fake right so he seemed kind of interested in that he wanted to know about my luthier he told me about the guitars he had but later on in this guy's messages he ended up admitting that it wasn't that guy who sold it to him at all he didn't look like the guy in the photos at all and it was an old man so it's like I feel like this guy was scammed in the early 2000s, and he's just trying to pass the buck at this point. But eventually, he just kind of stopped responding, I guess. So it's at this point when I learned about a chargeback claim. So remember, I had three different credit cards on this whole transaction. So I filed three independent chargeback claims, and I'm thinking, okay, Sergio was a bust, PayPal was a bust, nobody could help me before, but this time I've got the Bruce Kunkel document right away. There is no doubt that this is not real. There's no waiting time for any of this stuff to come in. I can submit all this on each of the individual claims. This is my last resort, my last chance to get my money back after PayPal gave me the middle finger here. Unfortunately, two of the cards... They said, no, sorry, it, it's been too long. You only have six months to dispute this. But thankfully, I believe it was City. City had my back. Despite being way too long of a time, they actually did give me $5,126 back because that's all I had within that particular claim. So even though this was a $15,000 scam, in the long run, I only lost $10,000. I was always hopeful that Sergio would eventually make it right, but at that point in time, that guitar was just at the Luthiers. It had been a couple of years, I'd never heard back from Sergio, so at that point in time, I'm like, okay, this is just my guitar. So I thought about having my Luthier. You know, it's already down there. I paid the shipping to get it there. I might as well at least get the frets all filed down, be perfectly nice. I even thought about maybe doing the proper refinish to make it look a little bit better without all the metallic flakes. Like, if I'm going to be stuck with what might be a real Gibson Les Paul that has been reworked into a snake pit, I might as well have the best looking one as possible without all the metal flake and whatnot in it. So that's when, once again, you can... Uh, Go back to this story. The snake pit gets stolen, essentially, but I do eventually get it back. And that was just a year ago, and it's taken me another year to build up the confidence to make this whole video, track down all these case numbers and old emails and stuff. So that's kind of where I sit on it yet today. 
I'm like over $10,000 deep in this guitar. It came back without any of the improvements done to it. I really don't want to send it off anywhere else. I just don't trust anybody who reworks guitars anymore. And I kind of explained a lot of that in the stolen back episode that you can check out here. But to my surprise, that video got PayPal to reach out to me because, you know, I was very upset with PayPal in that episode. Now, this wasn't like a PayPal executive or anything. This was a customer service relations member who gets assigned to certain people. And he just wanted to reach out and just say, hey, you know, if you don't have one of these guys at PayPal, I would love to be assigned to you. I watch the show. I'd love to be able to help you if a situation like this ever rose again. But then he wanted to know about the case numbers. And I was like, oh, man, this is fantastic. I finally have an in at PayPal. That's just the best news I've ever heard because I've never trusted PayPal again ever since this day. And they continued to lose my trust throughout the early days of my career, but they're just kind of a necessary evil in my business. So I told him, it's a shame you weren't there around at the time of the snake pit scam when he could have helped me with all this. Because he said it sounded like I got some pretty crappy service from one of their many third party service centers that they had around that timeline. So I was thinking, oh my goodness, is this guy actually going to be able to make a happy story on this after all. So in a last ditch effort, I thankfully still had these PayPal case numbers written down because they are long gone out of my account. There they are again, just in case anybody at PayPal is watching this because surprise, surprise, uh, none of the managers wanted to help us on this. But hey, you know, PayPal, if you want to make it right with me yet today in 2021, I'd be very appreciative of that $10,000 being returned to me because that first one, that was a chargeback claim. So I don't need that money back because I've already got it. So that is where we sit today. I am stuck with this snake pit guitar, but surprisingly, I've had a lot of people contact me wanting to buy it for Chinese counterfeit prices, 300 bucks, to which I say, yeah, no, I would rather keep it for that. And I've had some really good offers about half of what I have into it now that are tempting to take. But to be honest with you guys, I don't know, I might actually just want to keep this as a forever <laughs> reminder, like it's a good museum piece because it's kind of like a lore within my channel, you know, what is the true story of the fake snake pit Les Paul? It's just kind of part of my history at this point, like should we do a series where I do send it to a competent luthier and actually make it a good reworked Les Paul? The other option is I do sell it off and then one day just get a real snake pit. And that's about the same thing. But nowadays, you know, these snake pits are very rare. There's only one on the market and they want $100,000 for it. Previously, once again, you could pick one up for about 30,000 bucks if you really wanted one about six years ago. But what I do find kind of hilarious is uh, Reverb still uses my photo of the fake one for the poster child of the Slash Signature snake pit in their whole pricing guide. <laughs> I mean, that's what stinks. They even have it in their gallery, so somebody could make another fake like this and... Uh, <laughs> please, Reverb, I'm honored that you want to use those photos, but you should probably change those. And despite all this, I still kind of like the Snake Pit Les Paul because, you know, it's the first publicly available Slash Signature guitar. Very few of them made. It's the most ornate one. So maybe one day a Snake Pit will fall in my lap and I can keep it in my collection. But right now, you're probably wondering, what exactly is it? Bruce Kunkel thought it was a remade Les Paul standard, but I think it's time we find out. So next time we'll see you on the unboxing table and the workbench as well as a playing demo segment of this guitar. And hopefully we can find out together what this 